Ayn Rand is one of the most provocative voices of the 20th century. Her novels The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged have earned her fame for their popularity and notoriety for their content. In her many essays, public lectures, radio and television interviews, Ayn Rand offered a unique perspective on a wide range of philosophical problems. Yet academic philosophers, both in her time and ours, have responded her, to her work uh, largely with derision and dismissal. What explains this attitude by professional philosophers? Why did they routinely dismiss Ayn Rand? Welcome to New Ideal Live, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute. I'm Aaron Smith, a fellow and instructor at ARI. Joining me today is ARI Associate Fellow Mike Mazza. Now, Mike, in your article, Why Can't Professional Philosophers Get Ayn Rand Right? You address this question. And I wanted to spend some time talking with you about the article and about the case you make in that article, because I think it's an important case. Uh, and I want to just read a quote from that article. You say, until professional philosophers engage with Rand's actual arguments, their pat dismissal of her philosophy remains an unprofessional prejudice. End quote. For those who may not have read the article, can you give us some kind of an overview of what that article is about and what you're arguing in it? Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Um, so there are dozens of criticisms of Rand floating out there. Dozens is probably an understatement. Um, and part of the part of what we do at ARI and part of what I see myself as doing is advocating expanding on and teaching about Rand's, uh, Rand's philosophy. So part of that means responding to, uh, to criticisms. And many of the criticisms that are floating out there have responses to them in the kind of objectivist secondary literature, in podcasts, uh, on, you know, on websites. What I wanted to do in the article was to draw attention to a thread or a through line that characterizes most of these criticisms, particularly the ones that are coming from professional philosophy. Um, if you have been in philosophy classes as an undergraduate and discussed Ayn Rand with your professors, you probably get some version of she's not serious. She's not a philosopher. Her arguments are lame, bad, weak. Um, if they even concede that she has ar arguments at all, uh, there's more than a few who would just say she doesn't even argue for her positions. She takes these contra uh, controversial positions, but she won't give arguments for them. What she'll do is she'll write a mean character who has a view that she doesn't like and make them look stupid. And then the, the view, the view that she does like looks heroic in another character. Um, so why do they have this? attitude why do they have this mm, such a such a strong and impassioned rejection of her it's a kind of puzzle that a, a lot of her fans have when why am i getting this hostility from my professors because i like this like these ideas and also why can't my professors seem to criticize the views that i think i under, i think i agree with um, there's the accusation of straw manning Rand uh, is a common kind of response to these criticisms, <clears throat> these criticisms of straw man. So what I do in the article is go through some of the, uh, the criticisms that have, um, are sort of viral in the, uh, Rand fan world. That's the kind of Mike Humer's criticisms that I discuss, uh, have been floating around the internet for decades. And also criticisms from um, people in philosophy who are uh, prominent, even if I don't think they're good criticisms um, or or um, or even criticisms that have a lot of you know viewership, they're still mm -hmm. notable because of the stature of the people in the profession. Um, so what I did in the article is made the case that there's a uh, feature that all of these arguments, all of these criticisms have in common that fans of Rand and people who uh, maybe aren't Rand fans, but are just kind of interested in, in objectivism as a cultural phenomenon, um, haven't noticed or aren't aware of. So a lot of the responses to the criticisms that I 
discuss, for example, the responses to Mike Humer or the responses to Robert Nozick, so take the criticisms as as given and just you've got and respond by saying, well, you haven't correctly characterized her in this way or that way. What I'm trying to do is not reply directly to these criticisms, but show that these criticisms stem from some um, uh, a, a, a wrong approach to the uh, to the project of understanding and criticizing Rand. And that's the what I call uh, philosophical parochialism. One of the things I noticed from your article is that um, you don't take the tack that I think a lot of people take is they look at this some sort of mispresentation of one of Ayn Rand's arguments and they say, well, this is dishonest. This is obviously dishonest. And even if there is an element of uh, dishonesty there sometimes, uh, it's I think that's not the tack you take in this article. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so we're going to look at the issue of what you call philosophical parochialism and sort of unpack that. But just, just I don't know, for motivations point, like why, who cares what these academics think? I mean, you mentioned people like um, Brian Leiter. And now many people in the audience might not know who these people are, but these are all academic philosophers of mixed prominence. Some are quite prominent, some are less, um, like maybe semi-prominent, but Brian Leiter, Massimo Piliucci, I, I've written about him before, James Rachels, Robert Nozick, and you mentioned Michael Humer. Why do you think it's important to respond to these critics? Um, and I think in particular, the way you do. Yeah, so one one thing to say is that part of advocating a radical philosophy is you look at the criticisms, you think them through, respond to them. That's part of your uh, uh, job as, a, as an advocate of, of controversial ideas. Um, so so the it ha just so happens that as bad as I think some of these criticisms are, they're not all like terrible, but as bad as some of them are, um, they're about as good as you'll find anywhere. So if you look at the kind of criticisms you see in more popular presentations, popular books, not academics, but mm -hmm. um, you know, public intellectuals who aren't academics, you get the much more cruder, oh, she thinks um, Rand, Rand hates the poor. Uh, she wants if to- you're industrialist, uh, you're a moral hero. Yeah, right. she's, yes. Yeah, so if you're rich, that means you're great. Like that, kind of that level. And what the, even the bad article or bad arguments from the professional philosophers do is try to, you know, how is Rand reasoning about this and where is it wrong? That's That's what they're at least attempting to do or claiming to do. So they happen to be the, the best you find out there. Um, mm -hmm. Now, the other the other reason to do that is uh, most um, people who have a uh, impact on the culture at large go to college. Mm -hmm. And some, you know, uh, most people take some sort of philosophy class, whether it's a, a introduction to philosophy or whether it's just like an ethics, business ethics. Um, and that's where you're introduced to different ways of thinking about philosophical issues if you if you don't learn about them on your own. And in those textbooks and in those classrooms, it's the professionals who get discussed. And when Rand comes up, and I go through in the article some textbook presentations of Rand, it's always uh, or almost always uh, a hatchet job, a misrepresentation, or just just, you know, that's a attributing some motives to the people doing this it's just incompetence they just can't can't accurately portray her they won't quote her they'll say Rand says this but they won't give a quote they won't give a citation or they'll say go read uh james rachel is on ayn rand you know you don't have to read her you can... so let me just interject for a second uh for the sake of the audience so uh you mentioned james rachel's and they might not know who that is but um he wrote a book called The Elements of Moral Philosophy, and it's one of the most popular and widely used introductions to ethics, at least in the U.S. I don't know how, how broadly that sense, but at least in the U.S. It's a very slender, brief presentations, concise presentations of different major ethical positions, and it's just used all over the place. So it's, you know, when you address James Rachel, it's like, you might not know who that is, but it's it's the author of a widely used textbook that's just all over the place in philosophy departments. And so if you get a treatment uh, that mangles Ayn Rand in such a popular and widely used textbook, I mean, a lot of eyes are on that piece. So, 
yeah, it's also so it's one it's one of the most popular textbooks. I think it's in its fourteenth edition, something like that. It's it's been around for quite some time, and um, it's even when it's not assigned, the other textbooks that cite Rand are clearly taking their view of what Rand is saying from James Rachel's presentation of her. Um, and I so think, it's it's not know, just yeah, and I think also that I mean one of the major things is is that what these mangled arguments, these mispresentations of Rand's arguments that you get lead people to dismiss Ayn Rand as a serious thinker. Hmm. And I think the more that happens, the more this matters, I think, to us who think that her philosophic thought is new, original, um, really important. And to the extent to which they go to professional philosophers, they read treatments by these people who are experts in the field. And their assessment, yeah. judging by their presentation is, yeah, this is a pretty bad argument. Uh, so she can't think straight and uh, you know nothing to see here, kids. Uh, and yeah. that I think is the overall impact of this. And so, uh, Half the country. Half the country goes to college. You think half of them take an ethics class. Maybe three quarters of them encounter Rand in, in their ethics textbooks. She, she's discussed to some degree in a lot of the ethics textbooks. Um, yeah. And they think this is it. Like I don't, they come in with no opinion. I've heard of her. She's, you know, whatever. Um, and this is it. This is all there is to it. This is nothing. And then yeah. you, know, you don't have infinite time in your life to go explore everything. So you just dismiss her and, and never look back. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so it's, okay. it's, imp right. it's important to, to, to address these, um, these kind of criticisms, even though it's uh, easy to dismiss academics as off in the ivory tower. I mean, they have a impact on um, each subsequent generation, just through the fact that everyone goes to college. So, yeah. Okay. So fair enough. So let's let's get into uh, the parochialism here. So this is your main sort of claim in the article that one of the reasons why a major reason why academic philosophers don't get her arguments right is because there's something like a certain kind of parochialism going on. Can you say what parochialism is and how it's how you think it's operating? I mean, people for the full treatment, you can read the article, but just what what do you want to bring out here? Right. So you're being parochial if you're um... Uh, assuming your own um, and projecting onto someone else your own sort of views on the subject, assuming they agree with you on on um, on what you're discussing, and in philosophy, so if you're discussing a philosophical theory, um, it's a assuming um, concepts, definitions, views of what philosophy is and how it argues when you're approaching a figure who's disputing them. So if you're reading Ayn Rand or if you're reading um, uh, uh, Heidegger from the German tradition and you're an American 20th, 21st century mainstream academic and you read them and you're just assuming that they must be interested in the same problems 20th century American academics are interested in, that they share the same definitions, that they, they, they share the same methods and standards, you, that's a parochial approach to them. You have to understand that people in different um, philosophical uh, or historical context just have different um, different uh, interests, different definitions, different standards of uh, for what they're doing. And part of interpreting them objectively is not uh, imposing on them your own parochial assumptions. And my my basic argument is that this is how Rand is being approached. Uh, and I give an example in the article um, of a philosopher, Massimo Piliucci, who's criticizing Rand on um, on on her metaphysics, and he she she defines a metaphysical concept axiom one way, and he just says, "No, that's not how we define it." And my response is, "Yeah, that's not we. how you define it. Yeah, we. Who's we? Yeah, who's we? That's how you define it in the philosophy you're familiar with. But philosophical terms and definitions are, uh, I mean." It, there are things people argue over. What's the right way to define justice? What's the right way to define freedom? What's the right way to define axiom is the concept in question. And to just assume, well, this is the way my people define it. Yeah, that's what's in dispute. We're disputing. There's a 
there's a different way to think about it. And Rand saying hers is superior uh, or correct. And you're not going to, um, you're not going to decide who's right by just asserting your, your side. So that's a pretty crude version of it. That's why I start with it just to familiarize the, the reader with what it looks like. Um, but there's more, as the article goes on, we go into more complex versions of this, um, assuming that Rand must be arguing a certain way uh, because, well, how else would you argue? That's how we argue in 20th century academic philosophy, not being sensitive yeah. to the fact that she argues a different way. Yeah, so I want to ask you about the sort of form of argument that they think mm -hmm. is, I don't know, the gold standard, like how you're supposed to properly argue as a philosopher. Um, but I want, just to come back to Massimo Piliucci, I mean, just to read that, there's a real unseriousness um, on his part toward Rand, a real contempt uh, for his subject. So it's, you know, he quotes, like, as you say in the article, he quotes some statement by Ayn Rand, which says something about an axiom, but it's not a definition of the axiom. So he leaves out the definition of an axiom, leaves in the quote where she just characterizes some aspect of it and says, this is what she, how she defines an axiom. Wrong. He says, <laughs> I says yeah. oh, you know, without even like doing a little mini minor due diligence and just kind of like so where does she write about this how does she define this what it's just there's none of yeah. that it's just this is obviously wrong this is obviously silly and it's just this, that's not what it is an axiom is what what do you say um a premise where you start a discussion or something like that and it's like something you take for granted in a discussion and, mm -hmm. and like there's no investigation no thought as yeah to, well, does she have a different conception of what an axiom and what is that and what do i think of it and there's just none of that We'll, we'll come we'll come back to this, in, uh, I'm sure. But one of the things that's so f frustrating about this is that, I mean, I put in the article and you just said these a lot of these people writing about Rand obviously have contempt for her. And it's actually possible to have contempt for a figure you're discussing and not misrepresent them. <laughs> this mm -hmm. happens all the time in good um, philosophical historical scholarship. Where you're discussing a figure you think, yeah, they're views are really wrong and really bad, really evil. And I can write a paper about it and, and not um, caricature them or misrepresent them. So there's there's a lot of things going on. Um, and and that, that case is especially uh, a lot of th a lot of the things that are going on are especially obvious in that case. Yeah. And so part of it, I think, is stemming from this. Just there's a contempt for the subject, which leads to a cavalier, unserious treatment of the subject which then leads to wide, just common errors, gross misrepresentations, things that like, it's hard to take seriously. And you, I mean, speaking for myself, like I want to uh, respond to these things. And at some point it feels like, like you're flotting, uh, swatting a fly, so to speak. It's just sort of like, it, it, it's not worth the effort. And yet you want to respond. And yet the criticism is so poor that it's, it's, it's kind of embarrassing to respond. Um, but not, all these criticisms that you mentioned for sure in your article are of that caliber where it's just so silly, like it's, it's going to be a bit embarrassing to respond to it. Um, and you make the case that they're looking for a certain kind of argument. They don't see it in Rand and they try to reconstruct it according to what they think an argument should look like. And then something goes awry there. So maybe you can tell, tell us a bit about that. Maybe I hope I'm not mischaracterizing that. No, that, that's 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 fair. So um, there's a standard that philosophy, or I should say, um, philosophers in the kind of Anglo-American, what's sometimes called analytic tradition, that mm -hmm. they they want their craft to aspire to, and it's sort of like the standards of rigor in mathematics where you can put down certain propositions and then prove as a matter of um, formal deductive necessity uh, that a, some controversial conclusion follows from them or some, some important conclusion follows from them. Um, and that's now people in that tradition are aware that that's really hard to do, to, to find a knockdown argument that just follows as a matter of pure formalism. Like you think of, if you've taken a logic class and you write down like symbols, you turn an English sentence into a string of symbols and prove something about it. That's really hard to do. It almost never happens, but that's a kind of standard. We can try to approximate that. 
Um, and if you have that view as a kind of, well, this is what a good philosophical argument looks like. And it's not as it, uh, bad as it used to be, but there was a period of time where, um, you know, if you looked in a philosophy journal, this is 60s, 70s, 80s kind of, um, you'd see a lot of articles. Yeah, when Ayn Rand was writing, you'd see articles on, you, you think it's an ethics article. Oh, okay, this is going to be very, um, you know, uh, how to live your life, what's a virtue, what's a vice, what's a good, and you, instead you get um, analyses of the logical structure of sentences that has the, have the word ought in it. And there's a whole bunch of symbolic logic. You say, what does this have to do with, but that's the way people were thinking and, and writing at the time. Um, and that still goes on to, to a lesser degree today. A lot of the criticisms that I'm responding to originated in this time period and kind of just have been repeated without any um, reflection since then. And if that's your view of what good philosophy looks like, and that's your view of not just that's what good philosophy looks like, but that's just what philosophy looks like. And then you approach Rand, you read one of her articles, and she's not arguing that way at all. Like she rejects arguing that way. She thinks that's a bad way to argue. It's never going to get you anywhere. It's not going to get you to the truth. Um, there's a question of what do I make of this? And if you went to graduate school during that period of time, you might not even know that there are other ways people reason and argue. You might not have learned that. Um, and you might not see that uh, major figures in the history of philosophy are arguing that way because, you know, it's hard to parse a, a, an interesting philosophical argument and see what it, what its parts are. Um, so my, um, my conclusion is that a lot of the more sophisticated criticisms are trying to take something resembling what Rand says in her published essays and like shoehorn them into this premise, premise, conclusion, uh, structure of reasoning that the profession, um, values. And that's just not how she's arguing. And you make a case in the, I mean, I, I'm not, I, I take it you don't have any problem with <laughs> putting together premises and conclusions. I mean, the, one of the things that you do, you look in an article is what are the points that are adduced, uh, that are intended by the author to support or give evidence for uh, or plausibility for uh, a conclusion. I think obviously we're, we're not saying anything negative against that, but there's a particular kind of deductive structure that they're trying to, they don't find in Ayn Rand. So part of it is they think, well, she doesn't really have arguments because they don't find that. And then part of it is, well, she doesn't really have arguments, but let's see if we can put it in a deductive form. So where the conclusion follows necessarily from the premises, and then you're saying that's often not what you find in Rand's work. And you give an argument yeah. uh, in the piece. I don't know how much you want to talk about this, but her well, argument. So for... just, as a, just as a point of um, yeah. you know, evidence in favor of this as an interpretation of what they're doing. This is what Robert Nozick says he's doing, like explicitly. He but, starts his article. Saying, yeah, he starts his article saying, I'd like to reconstruct Rand's argument as a uh, a deductive argument with premises and et cetera. And then he says, I don't know what that is. So I'm going to fill in the blanks for her. Yeah. And that was on the Randian argument. That's on the Randian argument in 1971 or maybe 73. I, I yeah. And that gets referred to a lot. Yeah. Just look at yeah. Nozick's takedown in yeah. on the Randian argument. Again, that's yeah. the way these things function. So it's not like um, those arguments have been given well in this case there were responses contemporaneous responses to mm -hmm. nozick's on the randian argument article um and maybe you can mention some of those but uh yeah. um but often it's just but they the, stand as yeah just see just see nozick or just see um james rachel's and that's already been yeah. taken care of and then that's there part a, of the way these a, things are. there's an amusing uh, exchange on one of the uh major professional philosophy blogs, somebody writes in and asks, uh, what are the best academic criticisms of Ayn Rand looking for like ammunition? Um, yeah. and there's a whole bunch of threads or a whole bunch of replies, um, uh, with, uh, 
you know, recognizable names replying. And they come up with a whole lot of nothing except Robert Nozick's article. And he starts the article saying, I don't really know how to accurately represent Rand's ar argument. I'm going to give my own version of it. So that's like the best they can do when they're, when they're asked. So that's, I mean, you asked earlier, why is this worth responding to? Yeah, it's another reason worth responding to. It's like, you'll go to your professors and ask them, what do you think about Ayn Rand? And you'll get hostility. And then um, like really ask them, yeah. like what's a good and response? I, and if that's, yeah. Yeah. I think one of the really valuable things, I mean, uh, about your article is that you take the time to show what's, how these arguments go wrong. So it's Sidney Hook's famous criticism um, Robert Nozick's now famous article on the Randian argument, James Rachel's widely popular treatment of uh, Ayn Rand's egoism in uh, his uh, moral philosophy textbook. And to show that they go wrong, that they don't match Rand's argument, and then go on to say, underlying why they, uh, what's generating this, this, What's the mistreatment of the mishandling of the argument, the mispresentation of the argument is they have a kind of parochial view about what an argument looks like, what philosophy, what it means to practice philosophy. And they, as a result, they don't find these kinds of arguments in her. What kind of arguments do you find if you're not finding deductive arguments? I mean, she obviously, well, you have people that say she makes no arguments. Uh, again, for someone who reads that and thinks, like, what are you talking about? I think this also helps them to see like they're looking for a specific kind of thing when they're looking for an argument, they don't find it. But does she make arguments, Mike? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> read the article for the details. But in, in, yeah. in short summary, she does make arguments. They're not the kind of arguments you find in math. They're more like the kind of arguments you find in the sciences. They're explanatory arguments. She's looking to she's looking at some phenomenon about. Uh, so the example I give in the um, article is her argument for egoism. She's looking to explain why we pursue values to begin with. And then she used, she's using that explanation to go on and give a further explanation. So if this is why we pursue values to begin with, why do we need to pursue values uh, under the guidance of a systematic code? So it's a, she gives a series of explanatory arguments. It's more help if you want to understand the form of the argument, like how she argues. It's um, it would be more helpful to learn about explanation in the history of biology or something than it would be to look at how math structures its arguments. But it's the, the pattern in philosophy has been to look to math, not to the um, inductive sciences. So, uh, yeah, for the details, you have to look at the article. Okay. So I think one of the one of the values of the article, I mean, for people in, uh, who are interested in objectivism and frustrated by these kind of presentations of Rand's work, I think this helps it go go some distance in explaining what's behind it beyond well beyond other than or in addition to some kind of dishonesty or hostility toward Rand because the hostility is real, whether or not that factors in the presentation of Rand or not. Uh, I think it sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Like I think, he, like you mentioned, Nozick wasn't hostile to Rand and he was more sympathetic to her. And as far as you can tell, trying to present, to yeah. fairly present her yeah, case, I... whereas the, whereas other things are just kind of smears. Uh, and it's it's not yeah. always like that, though it often is. Yeah, I, think. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think Nozick is hostile. I don't consider Mike, Mike Humor hostile. Um, so if we're, if we're thinking about my question is why do professional philosophers, uh, why can't they get Rand right? I mean, I, I'm, what I'm trying to do is give a um, major factor that people aren't aware of. So if you really want the full explanation answer to the question, it's a, like a multi-factor explanation. So um, <clears throat> as we pointed out with uh, Massimo Piliucci's criticism, yeah, there's just some intellectual dishonesty here. He's quoting her out of context. Um, he's kind of just crudely asserting his own view as if that in and of itself is a response to anything. Um, and you know, the guy has three PhDs, like he knows what's wrong with that. Yeah. So there's there, yeah. that's certainly, you can't have a full, um, understanding of why some academics reject her so strongly. There's part of it is there's just some dishonesty. 
but I mean, dishonesty doesn't exist in a vacuum. So other relevant factors are there's hostility to her um, moral and political views are that's certainly relevant to understanding why she's rejected. Most philosophers are um, very left wing. So that's certainly relevant. They're all bought into um, altruism or just pure subjectivism as a, a moral um, moral framework. Um, so they're hostile to the egoism, just in, as a mat, as um, yeah. insofar as the content is concerned. And then you have to see all of those things interacting with the parochialism. So there couldn't possibly be a better argument for a good argument for capitalism. I mean, I've read, I've read uh, Nozick, I've read Milton Friedman, like that. She just has to be saying some other version of that. And those arguments are dumb. So I can just, I don't need to bother taking her too seriously. That's a, a kind of parochialism in and of itself. Uh, and then, you know, if, if, uh, if you are deep into Rand's philosophy, you'll be familiar with her claims that yeah, you can't defend capitalism without a radical revision of your moral and epistemological uh, uh, views. So that interacts, uh, that kind of um, factor interacts with the, uh, with the uh, professor's rejection of the, of the political views. So these are all, these are all relevant factors and um, what I want to, draw people's attention to is just this additional one that um, you might not have noticed. Yeah, because I think it's really non obvious, particular to people who aren't in the field. Um, and there is a sense in which so in graduate school, often we're taught to so we both have PhDs in philosophy. So we spent uh, time in in academia, but and learning about what philosophic arguments are supposed to look like, at least as we're taught. Uh, and you're often taught to sort of put things in standard form. You put them in terms of premises and conclusion. And often you'll read a piece that it's hard to do that with. And it's not just Ayn Rand. Like, so you read, uh, so one of the most widely assigned pieces of reading in introductory philosophy courses or introductory ethics courses is Plato's dialogue, Euthyphro, uh, where Plato, Socrates is talking to this guy named Euthyphro and Part of what happens in the dialogue is that he's questioning Euthyphro about his use of a particular concept and his understanding of it, uh, because his grasp of that concept is going to have an impact on how he functions in his life and on some important issue. And as they sort of go around and uh, ha in through the discussion, it turns out he doesn't really know what he's talking about. He doesn't have a clear headed notion of what kind of concept uh, He's, it's, in this case, it's piety, but you could substitute it, like in many of his other dialogues, it's justice, it's knowledge, it's, it's mm -hmm. and so on, uh, courage. Uh, and what he's pointing out is you don't have a clear view of what you mean by this concept, and yet you're functioning with it. And yet it's part of your operating system. And yet it's not, it's clearly unsatisfactory, like in a, ser in a significant way. And you need to pay more attention to that. Now, you, it's very hard to put that in some sort of standard form. And I've seen professors try to do it, it like as a TA in uh, mm -hmm. a course in ethics, I saw professors do that. And it was, it, it misses m most of what the dialogue is about. And it's like, yeah, Socrates is making this argument. And uh, if you put it in this form, clearly it doesn't the conclusion doesn't follow. And so because there's all sorts of counterexamples, and this is silly, and what a dumb argument. And it's like, you miss the force of a really important philosophical dialogue that has resonance today. Like, I mean, I, I assigned, even I, I teach objectivism, I assigned the youth of Rome, uh, for its power and its impact and the point it makes. And it's kind of, Rand is making something of a similar point in philosophy who needs it. And yet you miss it completely. I mean, that's just another example of this. This is how you're supposed to yeah. think about an argument. You don't find it in there. Let's shoehorn it into some kind of argument. The argument doesn't really work very well. It doesn't really represent what's going on in the, that philosophical work. And then you say, and then the students will go, yeah, well, Socrates is not much of a thinker. Well, I, I allude to this a, a little bit in the, uh, in the article where I, I, I make the point that the way Rand's arguing shouldn't, shouldn't be, um, it's, it's not as if she's got a completely out of left field new way to give a philosophical argument. Now, she's much better at it than the uh, philosophers in the historical canon um, 
but other philosophers give explanatory arguments, including including Plato. I don't think they're good explanations, but that's how they're reasoning. And one of the pieces of evidence to think that there's something unjust and and dishonest about how Rand is discussed by academic philosophers is, is if you really took the standards they're trying to apply to her and apply them to somebody like Descartes or Plato, you'd have to say they're not good philosophers either. Mm -hmm. They don't make the kind of rigorous deductive arguments that you're look that the 20th century figures are looking for. At least they don't always. Um, they're the theories they're most well remembered for are not argued for in that way. They're more argued for the forms best explain certain things. Like I cite the Fido in my article. But if and if you you know if you really like held yourself to that that standard they're they're trying to impose on Rand, then yeah, none of these people are serious thinkers either. Um, and now they don't do that. So why not? And that's where you have to factor in. Yeah, well, I mean, one is just, well, we're supposed, it's like a little second handed, we're supposed to think Plato is a good philosopher. So we don't raise these objections to him. But also, it's, you know, we'll, what Rand's a right winger, and we hate her for that. And she's a capitalist. And she says, it's good to be selfish. So we hate her views, too. And again, all these factors uh, interact. But I mean, any any time you see a kind of inconsistent application of a standard, and that's really at strong evidence. At least that there's something, raises a flag. Yeah, at least, at least raises a flag that yeah, there's there's several things going on here. One of which is just there's an injustice, and the other of which is you know you have to dig into understanding that, and that's part of what bringing out the parochialism of, of the approach uh, uh, does. Okay. Uh, so your article focuses mainly on the parochialism, and I think it's good that we did mention, you know, there are other factors going on. It's not just this, but one of the things is just like, this is one factor that's not often seen or noticed. Um, and I think it's like, maybe this is a bit of a side point, but, um, can you say why you think it's important to flag that the issue of parochialism? Cause I think about graduate students now, so you take a, a standard sort of fan of Ayn Rand, they read Atlas Shrugged, they read The Fountainhead, they get inspired by the novels. Uh, in some cases, it feels very, quite liberating. It's, um, they, it, it gives them a framework that is empowering and so on. And they read something like Ayn Rand's not really a philosopher, Our arguments are all bad. And it doesn't, it's harder for that to stick with them. But if you're actually studying philosophy or intellectual fields, and you come across these things, I think it's useful to note um, I think your article is worth reading, I think, in part, because I was just talking to somebody who was in political science, uh, and she was saying, um, uh, it, I, I, you know, I want to, I want to see Rand's arguments in deductive form. And she wasn't critical. She wasn't, she wasn't a criticism, a critic of Ayn Rand. It was just sort of like, that's what I'm looking for. And it's like, that's what we're seeing, in effect, taught to look for. And then if you don't see those, you don't find those. You start to think, well, maybe there's something to that criticism. Maybe she just doesn't really make arguments or her arguments are bad if you try to put them in deductive form and then it sort of mangles the argument. Yeah, I mean, Rand is saying philosophy is not like that. Yeah, say more about and, that. And that's, that's important because she rejects yeah. that method of, of argumentation, not yeah. just that like you, she doesn't do things like our professionals today do it. And so there's some confusion. It's she's saying, you guys don't know how to argue in philosophy. And I mean, she thinks the field has collapsed. So the whole field of right. philosophy, in fact, has collapsed in a in a fundamental way. They're not they're not forming systems anymore, predominantly. Um, and yeah, she thinks that there's a kind of dereliction of the field. If that's not well, you, you wouldn't you wouldn't so, so to just to just indicate that that there's more going on here. Like you wouldn't say that about. Um, the origin of the species or like Galileo's arguments uh, for the for the um, for the sun being the center of the solar system. Like, it, you wouldn't say I can't put it in a deductive form. So that means there's no arguments, you say. 
yeah, that's just not, the sciences just aren't like that. And Rand's saying something similar about philosophy is not like that. It's not like math where maybe in math you can do that sort of thing. She's saying, no, it's more like the sciences. And is she right about that? I mean, that is a philosophical question. Like what methods should philosophy use? Um, what kind of subject is it? And she's calling that into question and she's, she has her own way of thinking about it. And I mean, even it, 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 she indicates that she's doing that in most of the major texts when she argues for egoism in the objectivist ethics, she starts the essay by talking about how the science of ethics should look, how it should proceed, what its questions are and why people have not like been able to see that she gives a whole argument that the first question of ethics is does man uh what are values and and does man need them that's not usually how you start ethics when you take intro to ethics that's not how it begins so she's got a different view and she's telling you she has a different view and that's one of the you know one of the just indications that these critics commentators are approaching their um their subject with this parochialism is that she's literally telling you that she's doing something different and they just doesn't register. They don't even acknowledge that she say, they don't say, well, she says she's doing something different, which is really not. It's like, it's just goes in one ear at the other. Like it's not even there. Um, yeah. And I think, so one of the things I appreciated uh, the most in my own graduate school in philosophy, and I tried to emulate because I thought like, this is the right way to to approach a particular philosopher, um, particularly when you disagree with him or don't understand him, but well, it's usually him, <laughs> uh, is to understand the philosopher in his own terms or on his own terms, in the context of his times, addressing the kinds of issues that person does. So one of the things that's standard, and I think it's interesting that the philosophers that you mention in the article predominantly are not historians of philosophy. So That's I studied true. in departments where they had people, and I tended to gravitate toward these people, that are historians in philosophy, whether uh, in ancient Greek philosophy or typically early modern, where um, it's like, if you take, Descartes says this and this, and you put some premises and that's stupid, it's like, they, none of them approach it like that. They, they look at this and say, what Descartes is doing is he's trying, I and mean, they try to put it into context, what are his own aims? How does he think philosophy should properly function? How do you think you should argue? Why does he take these premises, which seem strange to us, for granted? Why doesn't he question these other things, which we think are obviously questionable? And it's taking the philosopher seriously. It's like, yeah, no, there's a reason why he doesn't question these things. And it's not because Descartes's stupid. He's brilliant. And yet he doesn't take these things, he doesn't seem to take X seriously or whatever it is, and we do, or he takes this for granted, and we certainly don't. And they don't simply jump in as, yeah, but he's stupid, and we dismiss that. They're like, yeah, well, what's behind that? Why is that? And they approach their subject with a seriousness, and I always really appreciated that. You learn much, much more about the thinker. You learn how to think about a given philosopher in context, and it gets you out of this parochial view where, you know, I came from a small town and everybody's Christian and this is our background and everybody knows there's a God and Jesus saved us. It's just like as if you couldn't think outside that village mentally. And I think a lot of what the good, good history of philosophy is getting you outside of your mental village. And there's. Yeah, and I, I think that's what has really expanded and enriched, I think, my understanding of Spinoza of Plato, uh, of Pyrrho, of Ellis, you know, take the, any of these fi figures uh, where you have really good professors that know the context and take their subject seriously. Man, you learn an immense amount. I only wish that philosophers would take that attitude to Ayn Rand. I mean, some do. They're typically fans of Ayn Rand uh, who are wind up being the experts in her philosophy. But then if you're a fan of Ayn Rand or a proponent or an advocate in some sense, uh, it's easy for others to dismiss, oh, those are just the fans. And then, uh, you know, but it's like, so you take something like the companion to Ayn Rand, right? This, uh, it's kind of an academic, oh, where are you, where are you? academic publication um, with a lot of serious content. 
uh, on Ayn Rand's, a lot of scholarly work on it. And, you know, it's often ignored, sadly. Um, yeah, you, but I, you I, started I, I wish that was more the approach. You started reading, I think it's the, is it the last sentence of my article? I think, I think it is. I should know. I yeah. Um, uh, yeah. That, that it, they're, it's, it's, that they're, yeah. That they're the, uh, their dismissal is unprofessional. I mean, this is one of the things that's actually praiseworthy about philosophy of the last 50 or so years, professional philosophy, is that the history of philosophy is way better than it used to be for just the, the kind of reasons you were just saying. The richer, it's they're much more sensitive to the um, author's philosophical, historical con context, understanding on their, them on their own terms, and they have no patience for people who would approach those yes. figures in a, like Plato in a parochial matter. That's why it doesn't happen because there's good scholars. Yeah, talk like, about current that dismissal. Is, I've heard professors yeah. like this guy doesn't know anything. Like that, that's the, there is like, this is the yeah. stupidest presentation of Kant or Plato or whatever it is. Cause like these people take their subject seriously and it's like, yeah. you're just way off. And yeah. from the history, you could, you could, you could never do the kind of, um, criticism that Sidney Hook or Massimo Piliucci did it that, that I go through in the beginning of my article to a major canon figure you just be like laughed at like you, you're this is yeah, foolish yeah. like why why is a philosophy professor writing this way so that's why I say it's it's unprofessional of them because yeah. there are good standards in uh, there are some good standards in professional philosophy and the kind of historical interpretive standards are um it, basically right on and well-functioning and you know, part of the issue is the window when they deal with Ayn Rand. Yeah. When they deal with Ayn Rand, I, I would imagine if, if, if there, if there are other parallel controversial figures that professional philosophers hate, um, that we'd see something similar in the way, in the way they approach them, um, I agree. them too. But I mean, Rand's a, but Rand, part of the reason Rand gets, such uh, strong reactions is that she's not an obscure an obscure figure that the profession kind of looks down at. She's like a mainstream popular. person to regular pe to regular people. She's popular. She's more popular than most almost any like living philosopher today. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's you know why another part of why she gets so much of this and other uh, other people do not. Yeah, I, I, that's an important point to raise is that um, if other canonical figures in the history of philosophy were afforded the treatment that the, the philosophers you mentioned talking about Ayn Rand uh, give Ayn Rand, I mean, they, they probably wouldn't get published. They'd be sort of laughed out of the out of the journal out of the, out of the journal, so to speak, because I like like in I wrote a piece called uh, why Massimo Piliucci gets Ayn Rand wrong. And it had to do with he wrote some piece on Ayn Rand and her relation to Aristotle. And I mean, it was largely just silly. And he, he took two quotes, put them into one block quote as if it's from the same thing. One's by Ayn Rand from one source. One's actually by Leonard Peikoff from a book, and then he attributes it to a wrong source by some other article that Ayn Rand wrote that he didn't know Ayn Rand wrote. And it was like, he said that this comes from some objectivist or something like that. That objectivist is Ayn Rand, Massimo. Uh, and it's just so cavalier, uh, which the way he treats it. Um, but I like the way you, well, you, well, you definitely choose Aaron, to treat the... in your article, the people who take Ayn Rand more seriously as well. Yeah. So one one of the th the one of the points I make in the article is that yeah, that you can laugh at how crudely foolish Massimo Piliucci's kind of jibes are, but um, it's basically the same thing as going on in the Rachel's textbook. It's just yeah. you, you know more. It's a uh, more um, clever uh, than than what he does, and I I don't want to put um, uh, Mike humor in this in this camp. I think in fairness mm -hmm. to him. He actually treats her um, with the level of respect that professional philosophers treat each other when they're criticizing each other. Mm -hmm. Like I, it's I a right. lot of times you, you get back and forth like, well, you didn't really get me right. This isn't and it, but it's like, no, he gives cites paragraphs that he's getting drawing his points from and 
And there it's just more like you could have a, a serious, like I think he's, you could have a serious back and forth with, with him. I don't think you could with Rachel's or um, Piliucci or Sydney Hook yeah, or I think some of the I others I, I cite. So we've been talking about uh, the critics right now of Ayn Rand. Um, but my guess is there are ways in which uh, even fans of Ayn Rand or <laughs> could be parochial in their thinking as well. Um, I mean, parochial thinking isn't restricted to <laughs> critics of Ayn Rand. So it's a kind of yeah. general kind of phenomenon, a way of approaching ideas from a kind of local yeah. limited perspective where you're not fully aware that you're taking for granted a lot of things that are at issue and then are there ways in which you think uh, even fans of Ayn Rand can be parochial and ways in which, if so, we can avoid that? Well, you you mentioned the value of the history of philosophy for, for breaking out of your parochial habits. I mean, like I say in the article, this is kind of the default way. I, where where else would you start but, but with what you're already familiar with and comfortable with? Like that's sure that there's nothing um, wrong with starting that way. But then you also want to be self-conscious like, yeah, there's a whole wider world out there that I'm not, you know, not familiar with. There's different ways of thinking about things. And part of, especially if you're into Ayn Rand and you're like a, a an undergrad, one of the best things you can do is just seek out other philosophies and like think about, okay, that Plato approaches it this way, Ayn Rand approaches it that way. Like try to understand why there's a difference there and really think about who's right and what is Plato assuming that I'm not or that Ayn Rand's not and what is she back and forth um, and you can you know you could do the same thing with your professors get criticisms from them so can I really answer this and do I do I know what's uh, what what where he's coming from is it just a you know is he just being um, more like Massimo Piliucci just straight up misrepresenting things or is he being more thoughtful like a more like a Nozick or a bike humor and do I have answers to these things and if I don't what does that mean that's that's the best thing you can do to train yourself to just question your own assumptions question your own premises check your own premises is to have them challenged yeah I mean a check lot of your times you're assuming coming straight out of yeah. <laughs> Ayn Rand's well, attitude a, a lot of, toward a proper methodology a, a lot of times a lot of times you don't know you're holding something as an assumption as a premise until you encounter somebody who doesn't and then it's like what what it, they seem stupid and this is what I say in the in the article about like the way she, Rand looks to some of these um pe people who are criticizing her like she's disputing assumptions so basic that they don't that they have that they don't even like bother debating about talking about and then she doesn't share them and it's kind of like who is this weird person who doesn't know that everything is like math like who doesn't know that like we all know this and, it, and um, then what we're saying here is it goes the other way too it so goes the other I way too yeah for, yeah for a lot of people uh including myself um reading ayn rand as a young person uh was my introduction to philosophy uh, I mean, I heard the word philosophy, but I hadn't studied any particular philosopher before. I read The Fountainhead, then Atlas Shrugged, and then everything. <laughs> and it was like, and of course, Ayn Rand introduced me to the subject of philosophy, um, in part via her own philosophy, but also her treatment of other philosophers. And so that's uh, what I sort of took for granted sort of at the outset. Um, now, I went on to study philosophy and, and take other philosophers uh, quite seriously, and I benefited enormously from that. But there is that sense in which you get introduced, many people get introduced to philosophy and to other philosophers via Ayn Rand's philosophy and what she thinks of those other philosophers. And then they can come in and spouting off things about Kant and they've never read Kant. And it's that kind of thing, which must be just as irritating to a Kant scholar. Um, sure. It's like, yeah, this is his view. And it's like, have you ever read Kant? Uh, well, no, but Ayn Rand said, they, I mean, that's would be just, that's, a, that's the sort of analog of what's so irritating yeah. to us when people treat Ayn Rand that way. It goes both ways. And the, the solution goes both ways, is applicable to both. Is applicable yeah, yeah. To both I mean, a, well. a, good, a good little a good little test for yourself is just like if you're super into objectivism and you're an under like you're a young philosophy student, want to make make the most out of your time in college. It, just a little check for yourself is um, when you're making an argument or a criticism of someone. So another figure, Kant or whoever, it's like, would if if somebody wrote what I or th th said what I just said about Rand, 
how would I take that? Like, what is, this is a complete met representation. You don't know what you've read. You, you haven't read anything. Yeah, if you're going into philosophy class and you say, oh, oh I know all about Hume. Um, I didn't read Hume. I listened to Leonard Peikoff lecture about Hume once. Now I know all about Hume. Like, that's a good place to start, but you don't know all about Hume. Um, and you don't want to do the same thing that the critics are doing. You want to uh, aspire to uh, um, a, a better approach. Don't Don't take objectivism as if it's self-evident and unquestionable i mean that's a, that's an aspect of objectivity yeah um, yeah so mike's article is called why can't professional philosophers get rand right uh, that's the one we've been talking about today uh, and i also want to point people toward an article i wrote called why massimo piliucci gets rand wrong he's a prominent philosopher of science and uh, it addresses a similar issue to the one mike is addressing um, I also want to point people toward a companion to Ayn Rand. This is the book of uh, scholarly work on Ayn Rand's uh, thought, and particularly toward chapter one, which is by Greg Salmieri, uh, which is available online as a free PDF. So if you click the link in the show notes, you can get that. Um, it's particularly important reading, I think, in this context, because it addresses Ayn Rand as, as a philosophical outsider and how to approach her work in that vein. Um, so that's it for resources for today. I think so. Stay tuned for next week's show and please send questions for future podcast uh, or future Q&A episodes to experts at einrand.org. If you appreciate our content, subscribe to our channel on YouTube, click the bell to be notified for when we go live or we post new recordings. If you're watching on Facebook, uh, be sure to like, comment or share the episode. It helps us reach new viewers. And if you have questions or comments about today's episodes or suggestions for further episodes, just email us at newideal at einrand.org. We read all of your emails and we reply to many of them. And with that, uh, we'll see you next week.